welcome back. This is an amazing time that we get to study the word. And it is always exciting when we open the scriptures. And I am particularly excited today because we get to go through a story. And I, I love telling stories. And I really enjoy the stories in the Bible. So I pray that this is going to be an amazing time for you. My name is Grace and I'd like us to pray before we start. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this time. As we get to just dive into your word and read through this story, we ask that, Lord, you will speak to every one of us uh, at the space where we are at, O oh God. Uh, we shall receive instruction uh, that will influence our practical living in our day-to-day -day lives. It's always beautiful to sit at your feet, Jesus, and just hear you speak to us. How I pray that our ears will not just be itchy to hear what we want to hear, but that we shall hear that which you want us to hear, Almighty God. I pray that our hearts shall be the good soil that receives your word, that, Lord, we may be able to bear fruit up to 60 and 100 fold. To you be all the glory and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. The story that I want us to go through today is a very interesting, interesting story in the sense that it is not talked about much, but the few times it has been talked about, I feel like, we haven't really had the opportunity to look at it holistically from where it begins to where it ends. Actually, I remember the first time I came across this story as a young girl, it wasn't really in the Bible. It is a musician who had sung about it. And they had sung about Hagar. And I, I found it to be interesting. So I was just like, ah, ah, this lady, why is her baby dying? Why, is she, why, 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 why doesn't she have water in the desert? And then just seeing how God provides the water and he tells her, don't cry, according to the song, right? <laughs> don't cry, your son will not die. Lift thy eyes and see the water in the desert. And that was my first encounter with this story. So today we're going to um, journey together. So just open your Bibles with me. This would be interesting if you can just open your Bible with me. And we shall read Genesis 21 first. Then we shall... Uh, Keep referring to Genesis 16 uh, so that we can get the whole context of the story. So Genesis 21 from verse 9 uh, says, And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she, which she had born unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Cast out this bound woman and her son, for the son of this bound woman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. Now, I want us to pause there. This is Sarah. We all know Sarah was Abraham's wife. And she did not have a child for the longest time. She's one of those stories that we use when we are encouraging ourselves that no matter how long your breakthrough will take, finally God will come through. And true, it's true. I mean, God is not bound by time. But in this specific situation, for us to probably understand why... Um, Sarah is in a situation where there is a maid servant in her home who actually has a child for her husband. We would need to go back to Genesis 16. That is where now the story where Hagar is introduced to us in the Bible begins. So what had happened is, um, actually before Genesis 16, Abraham at some point had gone to Egypt. And when he went there, uh, this guy decides, we will not tell people you're my wife because of how beautiful you are. <laughs> I was actually laughing because I was thinking, I boss, imagine your husband telling you today that he will not introduce you as his wife because of how beautiful you are. He feels like a woman overreacting over something, you know. But that was the case. So Abraham is like, so I will not introduce you as my wife because of how beautiful you are. And true to his word, she was very pretty. <laughs> Apparently, she attracted the attention of the, uh, of, of the people and she was taken in as a wife. But apparently, in that period, before, a, before she could get prepared to meet uh, the king, or before that whole thing could happen, they get revealed to and they understand that this is actually not his sister, this is his wife. And so he comes and apologizes. And part of the apology to Abraham is he is given back his wife and he is given maid servants. So it is most likely that it was at this point that Hagar came into the life of 
Abraham and Sarah. So when he, when she came into their lives, they had no children, and it was quite some time when they did not have children. So Sarah comes up with a brilliant idea, and she thinks, now that I cannot have children of my own, why not have a child through this maiden who will be our child? Okay? So she's just like, eh, let's find a solution. Let's find a plan B. And after finding a plan B, Abraham Minani, yeah, yeah, na Adam or the same WhatsApp group, they listened to their wives. And so they do what they are told to do by their wives. And in this case, Hagar gets pregnant and she gives birth to a son. So by the time we are meeting this situation and this story in Genesis 21, there is a bit of history. But you see, the history doesn't end there because as you read chapter 16, after a while, uh, Sarah begins to feel like Hagar and the son, now they are not they are not at the level of servants where they ought to be. Nikama kuna venye wameanza kupanda class kidogo because you see of course things will change. Now the person who has a child is the maid servant. And so the Bible records that she dealt unfairly with Hagar. So Hagar decides to run away. And as she's running away, that is where God meets her and is like, where are you coming from? Where are you going? And he instructs her to go back. So at this time, when we are talking to, when we are reading Genesis 21, Hagar had already tried running away from uh, the household of Abraham once. And so now Sarah has gotten, uh, Sarah now has gotten a son. Remember, she didn't have a son. Now she has a son. God has blessed her. Isaac has been born. And so verse 9 says, And Sarah now, uh, and Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, Now this is her going back to Abraham, saying, Cast out this bound woman and her son, for the son of this bound woman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. All right. And she says, and the thing, and, and the thing was very grievous um, in Abraham's sight because of his son. Of course, for Abraham, this was not just a child, this was a son. And he felt sad about the suggestion that Sarah had that now I have mine, and I do not see my son competing with the maid servant's uh, son for for space. You know, these things happen, these things happen. And in, in the spirit of getting rid of competition, she tells her husband that they need to get rid of Hagar and the son. And despite the fact that it grieved Abraham, he does it. So God tells Abraham, do not be grievous. This is verse 12. In thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bound servant uh, woman. In all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And also of the son of the bound woman will I make a nation because he is your seed. And Abraham rose early in the morning and he took bread and a bottle of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child and he sent her away. And she departed and wandered into the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent in the bottle, and she cast the child under one of the shrubs. Remember the song I was telling you <laughs> that I listened to? <laughs> yes. So she put the child under one of the shrubs, and she went and sat down over against him a good way off, like far from where he was seated is where she went to sit. And as she was there, she said to herself, let me not see the death of my child. And she sat over and lifted her voice, and she wept. Verse 17 says, And God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called Hagar out of heaven, and said unto her, What ails thee? Fear not, for God has heard the voice of the lad where he is. Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him in your hand, for I will make him a great nation. Now this is not the first time that she's being told that the son will be a great nation. Okay? Then he says, and God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad to drink. And God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an, an, an archer. Yes. 
and verse 21 says, and he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. This is one of the stories where, like in that small, what we hear, what we see in chapter 16 and what we have just read in chapter 21, we have been introduced uh, to these two people who, like just like that, that is their story, which would probably make us wonder what was so important about these people that the Holy Spirit felt we need to know about their story. A few things stand out for me, which is going to be in light with some of the questions that we will be answering. A few things stand out for me. One, I see how Sarah starts from a point of total lack and what we would call possibly desperation and finding a way out for herself and after a while, her blessing actually coming and her realizing that her initial solution cannot work and now she has to get rid of it. Unfortunately, in this situation, the, the solution that she had for the first time affected another person. I find it interesting that Sarah, despite the fact that she had once been given to other people and she knew what it was like to be uh, taken away from home, uh, to, to here she is being identified as a sister as opposed to being a wife, she had an idea of probably what Hagar would have been experiencing. But for some reason, Hagar doesn't seem to be involved in the conversation that Sarah and Abraham are having concerning having a child whether it is concerning, uh, even when, even at the time when Sarah feels that things are not working and she begins to deal harshly with her, still she's not involved in the conversation. Abraham, uh, 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 Abraham still doesn't involve her in the conversation as at the time when it is time for her to go. All he does is he prepares her, gives her the water and what she needs and he sends her off. Now, at this time, and at the time when this was happening, it was very typical because slavery was a thing. And a slave really was not, was not considered to be a person. But you can see how this whole story, you can see how this whole story gets a lot of things mixed up. How Sarah is doing one thing today, tomorrow the results of what she thought was supposed to be a solution seems to be unbearable. And suddenly she wants out. And how many times have we found ourselves in such situations? Especially when we have to wait for long. And we feel like, it's okay, I can continue waiting. But in the meantime, is it possible for me to get something that I can do? Or is it possible for me to get a temporary solution? Is it possible for me to create um, an environment that is a bit bearable in this hard situation? What we fail to realize is that at times in our thinking and in our wanting to sort out our own uh, problems our way, we end up causing another problem in the future. Because I assume had Sarah not had a son with, uh, uh, had she not asked Abraham to have a son with Hagar, we would not have had the situation of a fellow woman having had to be chased out of her, of now the home of her son, I think, here yeah, the home of her son, because that's a slave. So she's not to meet her, but she has to be, she, you know, she has to be taken out. Like, this whole thing would not have happened had Sarah just waited on the Lord patiently for God to give her a child. However, we cannot overlook the fact that God is just. Because, see, Hagar wasn't an, an Israelite, she was an Egyptian. And even in her being an Egyptian, God still reached out to her and he cared. God still thought, okay, hi. In fact, Hagar is involved in this conversation, as you read the Bible, only when God himself, the angel, when he's calling out to Hagar. That is the only place where we see somebody actually bringing Hagar into a conversation about her own life. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that very amazing? That all this time these people are having plans and talking about someone else's life and it seems that it is them calling the shots. But when Christ comes into the picture, when God walks into this situation and he needs to put things in order, he addresses, he addresses the lady. 
and he's like, I see you. I see what you have been through. I see what you're going through. And I want you to know that this son, he is blessed. And not only is he blessed, but even for this need that you have right now, that you need water, you don't want to see your son uh, die, surely I will provide. And as we go through that story, I am interested in answering a few questions that I pray that you would also be able to answer uh, on your side as you as you as as you reread the story. I trust that you will. Is that one? What does this word teach us about God? Two. What does the word teach us about human beings? And then three. What does God want you and I to do in response to what His word has taught us? So a few things that I can pick from what this word teaches us about God is that God cares no matter who it is. He's not a God who will be there for the rich and leave the poor. Neither will he fight for the poor and leave the rich. He takes care of all of us. Another thing that stands out about God is how he is watching from heaven. He is not interfering with this um uh, He's not interfering with what uh, Sarah has to do as long as Sarah has not gone to the Lord. He doesn't interfere with what she's doing. But at the point where Abraham is grieved, and I assume his grieving comes to God's attention, and that is why God tells him, it is well the second time, just allow her go. Hear what your wife is saying and allow this lady to go. He gets concerned. When Hagar is in the middle of the desert and there is no hope left, right, and center, when she lifts her voice and begins to cry, the Lord shows up. And what do I learn about God? Is that every time we call unto him, he will answer. In fact, his word tells us, call unto me and I will answer you. And I will show you great and mighty things that you will, like beautiful things. Things you cannot even imagine. And today I can encourage you that we can count on God. That if we call on him, he answers. As long as we choose to do things our own way, he will let you. He will let you. He will let you. But when you call on him, he will always answer. What else can we learn about God from this story? I don't know what is standing out for you about the character of God. But as you meditate on it, I pray that it shall form a solid foundation in your relationship with God. Now, what does this word teach us about human beings? At times, human beings will change mind. In fact, not just at times, every time we are changing our mind. Today you wake up and you want this, tomorrow you wake up you want another thing. And so... We should learn that despite the fact that we as human beings tend to think we know what is right for us or we tend to have desires that are so strong, it is important that we run it through the will of God. You remember that scripture that says that he has good works planned for us from the beginning, yes. You remember also when he's telling Jeremiah, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I knew you, yes. So it is okay for you to go back to God and ask him for the blueprint. Ask him for the blueprint. Because what we are learning is that as human beings, we change our minds. On the other hand, truly God doesn't change his mind. Word says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. What else can we learn about human beings? That you cannot depend on them. I cannot depend on you. You cannot depend on me. In fact... I don't know if you have experience when scripture says that cast is the man who puts his trust in other men. Have you ever put so much confidence in a person such that when that person does something wrong, it breaks you to a point that you think, but this person is human. Why would you break? Why would it break you that this person has gone wrong? Yet they are actually human. The pain, the curse of putting your trust in a fellow man. Ah, you don't want to experience it. And so what do we learn about human beings? We learn that they cannot be trusted. I cannot put my trust in you. You cannot put your trust in me. We all need to turn to Christ and put our trust in him. We learn about human beings that it gets to a time when life throws at us situations that we cannot handle. Because we are human. Only God is sovereign. Only God is great and mighty. As human beings, there will always be a situation at one point or another in your life that you will not be able to handle. But when that time comes, lift your voice and speak to the Lord. In that moment of trial, 
in that moment when it feels like your back is against the wall, like we sing in the song, when that point comes, when you say you're between a rock and a hard place, turn to Jesus. As a human being, you cannot sort yourself out, but trust me, God can sort you out. And the final question, what would God want you to do in response to his word? In this word, are you Abraham? Do you see yourself in a situation like Sarah, where the things you're waiting on God, they're not working and you feel you can find us? you can find a solution. Are you Hagar, who you feel like there are people, other people who are making decisions about your life and these decisions are affecting you to the very core of who you are? Are you this young boy who is just in the desert? You are in this home, suddenly you've been packed and you're going and there is this word over your life and eventually you will be given to an Egyptian. Who, who is it that you relate with in this story? And as you relate with this person, what is God asking you to do? Is he asking you to trust him? Is he asking you to put your confidence in him? Is he reminding you that even in the desert, he is walking with you? Or is he saying, hey, warning, do not find a solution for yourself. I got you. Is he saying, be still and know that I am God? What is God saying to you today? I would encourage you, that which the Lord is telling you, write it down, hold it close to your heart. May that be your encouragement in the season that you're going through. For truly, victory is found in obedience in the word of God. And I pray that as you take time to obey his word, as you take time to obey the instruction that he gives you, as you study through these different characters in this story, that truly you will work to show Jesus Christ to be the ultimate, for truly he can be trusted. I pray that you are encouraged. I pray that you are blessed. And allow me to pray with us before we finish. Father Lord, we are grateful. We are grateful that we have your word that we can always interact with. And sometimes it is hard to imagine and picture in totality exactly what was happening as these stories are being narrated through your word. But we thank you that when we sit at your feet, you get to open our minds to understand things and to see things that we hadn't seen before. Lord God, for every one of us that is listening at any given point in time, we are either feeling like we have made wrong decisions that are coming to bite us in the tail, or we feel like we have been forced to make decisions for the sake of peace around us that we are not necessarily comfortable with. Or we feel like decisions have been made that affect our lives and we feel like we have no control over them. And sometimes it feels like we are in the desert and we do not know what direction to turn to. And so together as brothers and sisters, we turn to you and we ask, Lord, may your perfect will be done in all our lives today. We ask that Jesus, for every person that is tuning in and listening in, that they will walk by faith in obedience to your word, that they will get the encouragement they need where they have been encouraged, the rebuke that they have been, for those that have been rebuked, for those that have been canceled, that they will receive this counsel and that they will hide this word in their heart and that Jesus, we shall all strive to make you proud. We shall all strive to make you famous. We thank you and we bless your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen and amen. So thank you very much for listening. See you next time.